Good evening, everyone. Whoa, that's loud. If I could invite everyone to please take their seats, our distinguished keynote speaker has arrived, and we will be able to begin the ceremony very shortly. Again, if you could please take your seats, we will begin the ceremony very shortly. Thank you. waiting for me to sit. <laughs> Distinguished faculty, NMUN, delegates, most honorable guests, my name is Michael Eaton, and I have the pleasure of serving as Executive Director of the National Model United Nations. Let me be the first of many people to welcome you this year to the 2023 NMUN New York Conference. Oh. As you look around the room this evening, you will see a ballroom that looks very much like the United Nations. I was trying to find some statistics to have for you. We don't have them all compiled for this conference and our sister conference next week, but in the end, there will be more than 105 member states represented. More than 57% of you have come from outside the United States and then more than 47% or more than 47 of the US states represented here. And it is meaningful that you look like the diversity that is represented in the world. It's also meaningful to me to welcome you to my home country, the United States. You come here during sort of a difficult time in our history. If you watch the news, sometimes it seems like more of a divided states than a United States of America. And when I look out into the audience tonight, what I see is hope. So thank you for bringing that energy here to NMUN. I, I hate to admit this, but I used to love watching the news. I think this is a safe space to admit that we all like watching the news and international affairs. Um, but when it's become more depressing, I, I find that sometimes more and more I'm looking for different news sources. And this is going to make me sound, I think we're amongst friends, a little bit geeky, but one of the things I read as a news source 
um, is the U.S. mission to the United Nations. Like, not all of the diplomatic readouts, but some of the speeches of our keynote speaker. And what I find when she talks about making gumbo for diplomats overseas or quoting Amanda Gorman in front of youth, and, and I say this very sincerely, is that she makes me proud to be an American. She represents the best of this country. And so whether you have come here from as close as New York City, and we have a group here from Manhattan College partnered with a school from Ukraine, or whether you've come from as far away, I was trying to figure this out earlier, I think the school that has flown the farthest, I thought it was Japan, but it's actually from Taiwan. You're, you're here now and, oh, yeah. Yeah, you, 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 tra you traveled almost 8,000 miles. You deserved a round of, of applause. But, but you, you're here now and I think you're about to learn and from an example of what it means to be a diplomat. Her full bio, we should let you hear from the speaker. Her full bio is available on our website. I will highlight a couple of those pieces. She was the ambassador from the, to, from the United States in Liberia. She has postings in places like Kenya, Pakistan, the Gambia, Nigeria, Jamaica, and the US mission in Geneva. She served as Assistant Secretary of State for Sub-Saharan Africa, among others. She was Director General of the US Foreign Service, was the Director of Human Resources and a 70,000 strong workforce. She could, if she chose, give a master class in what it means to be a diplomat. Because we're two blocks from Broadway, I will borrow from Gilbert and Sullivan and simply say that she is the very model of a modern major diplomat. <laughs> Awards that she has been given for those of you that follow American foreign policy and honors have names like Hubert Humphrey and Warren Christopher. It is just an absolute honor and pleasure to welcome the United States representative to the United Nations, Linda Thomas Greenfield. I'm much better doing this off the cuff anyway. So let me uh, say hello and welcome all of you here. This is an amazing group of people. I'm going to apologize first for my voice. This is not my real voice. I just uh, came back from a trip, lost my voice giving the keynote address at the Summit of Americas. Uh, it, Started out okay, as I'm doing okay right now, and in the middle of the speech, there was hardly any sound coming out. So my staff shortened my speech because they were afraid that I might lose my voice again. So I apologize for that. And then I'll tell you a few kind of things off the cuff. When I first became an ambassador, I remember walking into my embassy. There were a crowd of people sitting I walked in, they all stood up, and I forgot to tell them to sit down. <laughs> and they were standing forever, and I was speaking, and finally someone nudged me and said, you know, if you don't tell them to sit down, they're not gonna sit down. <laughs> uh, so I did remember to tell them to sit down, but I didn't remember to sit down here. So that's what was happening up here as you all saw us standing because I was supposed to sit so the others knew to sit and I forgot to do that. That's a lot of the protocol stuff that we sometimes have to deal with when we're in the Foreign Service. I've been doing this for almost 40 years, probably 40 years, uh, so none of you were born when I started uh, to do this. I don't even, I'm not even sure anybody on the stage was born when I started uh, doing this work. Uh, it has been really a labor of love for me, and I'm really delighted that you all are here. 
So let me start with my speech and I'll probably go off the cuff a bit. When the voice starts cracking, I'll bring it to an end. But again, welcome to all of you and good evening. And I can't tell you what an extraordinary pleasure it is for me to be here and to welcome you to New York City, the home of the United Nations. Mr. Secretary General, Mr. PGA, all of the member states who are here today, I'm told only 105. I don't know where the 188 are. I mean, the 88 are that are missing. Uh, when I'm whipping boats for resolutions in the council, uh, everybody kind of forgets that we win and they look at the absentees and the abstentions. So I'm happy that I've never had 88 absent countries when we are looking for a vote because absences are seen as a statement uh, on resolutions. But for the 105 countries that are represented here today, uh, welcome uh, to the UN General Assembly. You know, nothing gives me more pleasure than connecting with young people from all over the world. And when I've traveled, uh, I can't even begin to tell you how many countries I've been to. I've been to every country in Sub-Saharan Africa except for four. Um, don't ask me what those are now because I'm gonna forget them, but I'm vaguely thinking Eritrea, if you're here in the room. Uh, I haven't been to Sayatome, I haven't been to Seychelles, and I haven't been to Guinea-Bissau. So they're on my list of the four countries on the African continent and Sub-Saharan Africa that I'd like to go to. I've been on every continent uh, in the world. Whenever I've traveled for official purposes, I always make it my business to meet with young people. And the reason I do that is because you really are the future uh, for all of us. We're going to be depending on you. We'll be putting lots of burdens and challenges on your shoulders, but it is important that we pay attention to you and mentor you and, and really do our best to prepare you for the future challenges that you all uh, will uh, be facing. And I'm particularly pleased that all of you here are passionate about the UN. So this past Friday, as I was telling you, I returned from a trip that took me to Ecuador and Costa Rica. And I met inspiring young people in both of those countries who are really shaping the future of democracy in the region and around the world. And during my keynote address at the Summit for Democracy, where I lost my voice halfway through, I announced that together with the Community of Democracies, we are launching the Global Youth Democracy Network. The Youth Democracy Network will provide a direct line for young people to reach government officials. It will ensure young people are essential players in the policy making process. Our vision is to inspire, to train, to unite the next generation of civic leaders and activists. But I'll let you in on a little secret. Thanks to Model UN, you already have a head start. Model UN is preparing you to lead. It's preparing you to bring about the change that we all need. It's preparing you to take on the issues of our time. When I was your age, uh, unfortunately, I didn't have the opportunity to participate in Model UN. I didn't even know that such a thing existed. I grew up in a rural area in Louisiana. So there was no such thing as Model UN. But I was at a reception last night sitting next to a very bright young man from Queens, a third year law student at Harvard. And he, he said to me he didn't know the UN was in New York, that he didn't know the building was right across the river. So I have invited him to come and visit me at the United Nations. And one of the things that I have made as a priority for me is to take the United Nations out of 
Turtle Bay, to actually take it to Queens, to take it to the Bronx, to take it to the inner city, to Harlem, uh, to take it around New York, and then take it further afield, to go to Louisiana, to a little rural town, and talk about the United Nations, to go to Arkansas and talk about the United Nations, to meet with members of Congress, our Congress, who many of whom don't really appreciate the importance of the United Nations, and to invite all of them here to New York to see the important work that we all do. In Ecuador last week, I thought it was important to talk to their population about how important it is that Ecuador is an elected member of the Security Council because their population didn't quite appreciate how important a voice that gives Ecuador regionally, but also globally, that a country, a small country like Ecuador can be making decisions about peace and security around the globe. You are in important places now. You can take those messages back home as well to make sure that your communities, your, your politicians, uh, your family know that there is a United Nations and that that United Nations, that global organization, the only one that exists in the world represents all of us. It wasn't until after I started college that I first traveled abroad, and I know many of you have traveled. Uh, one of my professors encouraged me to go to Africa, and literally it was a life changer for me. I'd been planning for a bit uh, to become a lawyer, and then I decided I wanted to become an academic, I never knew there was something called the diplomatic service that I might also uh, consider as a career. Uh, but when I went to Liberia in the 1970s to study, it really opened up uh, so many doors for me. It opened up tremendous opportunities for me. It made me want to see the world, and it also gave me the impetus to want to serve my country. And I then decided that I would pursue a career in the Foreign Service. Over the 35 years that I was in the Foreign Service, before I retired and before I came back uh, in, in 2021, 20, uh, I had the chance to live around the world. And you heard some of the places I served in. I consider myself an Africanist, so I served quite a bit of my career in Africa, but I also served in Pakistan. I served in Switzerland. I served in, in Jamaica. I got an opportunity to travel to Afghanistan in the 1990s, the first time around when the Taliban took over. So we know what to expect because we had the experience of dealing with them even in, in the 1990s. I then had the opportunity to serve in what I think were the most important jobs in the Foreign Service. I worked on refugee and humanitarian issues, serving as the refugee coordinator in Pakistan, as the refugee coordinator in Kenya, as head of the Refugee and Migration Affairs Office in Geneva, where we made decisions about providing humanitarian assistance for needy people around the world. And what is so amazing to me is as I look back, and this was more than 20 years ago, I went to Kenya and the refugee camp that I visited in Kenya 20 years ago is still there. But what was different was to hear from the Kenyan president for the first time acknowledging that many of these people cannot go back home and they need to have an opportunity to settle in Kenya. And I was taken aback by that decision and I applauded that decision. I thought it was uh, something extraordinarily uh, important. Many of those people are from Somalia. I see the Somalia placard all the way in the back of the room. 
Uh, we've had conflict going on in that country uh, for almost 30 years. There are hundreds of thousands of refugees who have come uh, to Kenya and they've been there for two generations. They were born in the camps, they grew up in the camps, they've gotten married in the camps and they've had families in the camps and they don't know what living in Somalia is like. But they're also reading in the news that Somalia is on the verge of a famine. So you're not gonna rush to go back home when you're hearing in the news that your country is on the verge of, of a famine that was averted a few months ago, but now we're experiencing that uh, again. Your country is dealing with uh, tremendous issues of insecurity and terrorism. In fact, when I was there a few months ago, two days after I left, there was an attack at the airport where I was. These are issues that we have to deal with that are related to peace and security that continue to dog us uh, for many, many uh, decades. But there are some great things about my job. I was, when I was in Santa, um, in um, uh, San Jose uh, this past week, one of the young men driving for my security details sent me an email and told me he was from Kosovo and that his family had left when he was 12 years old as a refugee and he'd lived in a refugee camp and he was living the American dream. And he knew that I had worked on refugee issues and I had the opportunity to meet him and to hear his, his gratitude, but also to see his success in the United States. I also happened to have met uh, our representative from Minnesota, Ilhan Omar, who was from Somalia originally. Ilhan was a refugee in Kenya and came to the United States uh, when she was eight years old. And now she's a representative in our Congress. This is why we do this work, because you know that every day you're making a difference in someone's life. I also had the opportunity to serve as the Director General of our Foreign Service, and that's the job that is responsible for personnel. The job of recruiting young people like yourselves, for you Americans who are in the room, training, deploying, and occasionally have, having to fire someone, which is the worst part of the job, uh, but making sure that our foreign service was ready and prepared for the future, for the future challenges. And that foreign service is one that represents the face of America, that it is a diverse foreign service. Uh, it is a foreign service that has uh, it's gender balanced, and I'm, as I look out in this room, I'm amazed at uh, seeing the number of women in the room. And pardon me, Mr. Secretary General, you will be replaced by a woman. <laughs> Good. Well, I'm actually speaking to the current Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, because we've never, ever, had a woman Secretary General. And we all think uh, it's about uh, time that uh, we find our way uh, to that place. I also served as the Assistant Secretary for African Affairs. Uh, and in that position, Again, I got to travel over almost the entire sub uh, uh, in, entire continent of Africa, but almost all the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, where again, I had the opportunity to set policies that helped us to prepare for our future relations uh, with Africa. Africa is a continent in which the medium age is 19 
That means that half the population is under the age of 19. Countries like Niger, where's Niger? Is Niger in the room? You're one of the 88 absentees. Uh, Niger, the, the medium age is 15. Uh, this is a young, I see you back there, Rwanda. Uh, this is an extraordinarily young continent with immense opportunities. And one of those opportunities is their young people. It's the greatest resource. We set up a program in Africa called the Young African Leaders Initiative, where we were bringing to the United States, maybe, I, I think, I don't know what the numbers are now. When I was Assistant Secretary, we'd gotten up to about 700, but we would bring about 150 to 200 every year, and they would spend six weeks at a university or universities across the US and train and I, I can't even say they were training in leadership. They were honing their leadership skills. They were honing their leadership skills in, in uh, public administration, in business, um, in, pub, in uh, working with NGOs. And what we've seen as over the years, and this program started in 2013, many of them have gone on to significant leadership positions in their government as ministers, uh, heads of businesses, they've done amazing work. So that has said to me even more how important it is that we engage with the young, pro, uh, the young people of, uh, of the world. Through Model UN, you're studying crises and conflicts that tragically don't often make the news. You're learning how the United Nations work from Security Council procedures to the roles and responsibilities of the six main committees. And I have to tell you, when I came here two years ago, I didn't know what all those committees were. I didn't have a clue. I walked in the door as, a, as an Africanist with a strong background in humanitarian affairs. And suddenly I'm dealing with Yemen and I'm dealing with Israel-Palestine and I'm dealing with Ethiopia, which I knew, and then I'm dealing with Ukraine. And you find in this job, you have to deal with the world. And what I learned about myself, something I didn't know, was that if you care, you can learn about anything. You can do the jobs that you have been assigned to do. And you have to have good people around you, of course. So I have a lot of extraordinarily talented, smart, young people around me who are experts on every region of the world. Uh, and they have all succeeded in making me an expert on all of the regions of the world. So what you're learning here will be important for helping uh, your, your leaders as you work your way up the ladders of, of leadership. Above all, you're building relationships. You're building relationships with peers and you're building relationships with mentors from other countries. Who knows, your allies in the General Assembly could become lifelong friends. I'm amazed here in New York, people that I've met along the way in my career are people that I met years ago. And sometimes people ask me, well, how do you know those people, Linda? Well, one thing I'm very good at is developing relationships. So I consider the foreign minister of Finland a friend who I met many years ago. You know, the president of Namibia I met before he became president. And you develop those relationships and people remember. They remember and you are able to bring those relationships into play as you're trying your best to do uh, the jobs that you've been asked to do. So as you move through your lives, my hope is that you too find ways to develop those relationships, to serve others, and I hope that you set your sights high. Uh, there's no goal that you can't reach. 
The world is basically open to you. I love to quote former president of Liberia, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, and I, it's not quite the quote she gave when she gave a speech, but basically what she said, if your dreams are not high enough to scare you, they're not big enough. So you need to dream big, you need to dream the impossible, you need to dream the nightmare scenario of becoming the US ambassador to the United Nations or the secretary general, because I didn't dream this. I didn't even see it. I didn't see it until I was appointed. I want you to see it. I want you to be prepared. I want you to know that wherever you go, you can go to the top because you are being prepared for that. So here I am. As I said, I never imagined uh, that I would have this honor and it is, it, it's truly an honor to serve in this position, to serve the American people, to serve the American administration, but to serve the world is the greatest part of this job. Because I know when I go to Ukraine, and we just met this wonderful person and her four-year-old, that people are watching me, and it does make a difference. It makes a difference that they know that I pay attention, that they know that I care. I go down the streets and people from Ukraine will yell at me, thank you. And I'm like, how do they know who I am? Uh, but they know. Even on a bad hair day, they know who I am. <laughs> and uh, in seeing me in this role, I hope, again, you begin to imagine yourselves. I hope you imagine yourselves in the biggest, toughest leadership jobs of the future. Because again, we will need all of you there. And I can tell you that all of the experiences that I had in my life really did do wonders in preparing me for this job. It prepared me for solving some of the key global challenges that we're all facing today. And as you know, you know what they are. The UN is on the front lines of addressing climate change, public health threats, you know, the next pandemic is just around the corner. Protracted conflicts like the situation in Somalia and other challenges that transcend borders. Global challenges that demand global solutions. That's going to be your jobs. And that's why from day one, the Biden administration has renewed the United States commitment to the UN and other multilateral institutions. We rejoined the Human Rights Council, the WHO, and the Paris Agreement. And we've made clear that we will work with any and every member state to advance peace and security. We've invested in the UN, just as you, you've invested in model UN. And one of the things that I've been doing over the course of the past few weeks is hosting a series of listening sessions with member states to talk about UN reform, to talk about Security Council reform, to talk about expanding the Security Council, increasing the number of permanent members and increasing the number of elected members of the Security Council. And while it may not happen on my watch, it will happen on, on your watch. I'm hoping that something will happen on my watch, but you can be assured that something will happen on your watch. And I have to tell you, even in my toughest days in New York, when progress is slow, I always approach my day with hope. And the reason I'm able to do that is because I know that there are tens of thousands of young people like you who are preparing to take over the mantle of leadership. So I wanna leave you with one piece of advice. 
And it's two words, and it's two words that I use all the time. And it's the two words that are responsible for my success in my career. And it's guided me through my entire life. And that is, you have to be kind and compassionate. Kind and compassionate at whatever job you're doing. Even in the hard-nosed field of foreign affairs, being kind has always been the first move that I've made on my chessboard. Always been the first move. And I know you will find the same if you take that same approach. You'll find the same to be true. I look forward to seeing all of your accomplishments in the future. I know that in this room are the next UN ambassadors from all of the countries that you're from. I know that in this room is a next Secretary General. I know that in this room are heads of state of the future. I know that in this room are our leaders of the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. There we go. If we're going to ask that the AV turn the lights back on for a moment. Unfortunately, the ambassador needs to return to her busy schedule. I'm going to ask a favor of all of you as one extrovert to another. Let's give her one more round of applause before this famous person does and send her back on her day. Thank you. So if we could get the video played, and I would ask you to look at the two video boards for another warm welcome to all of you. Thank you for taking part in this Mother United Nations Conference and for believing in the power of global cooperation to solve global problems. We need your engagement and ideas today more than ever. Conflict, poverty, hunger, and inequalities are on the rise a surge of mistrust and misinformation is polarizing people and paralyzing societies. Human rights are under assault. And the triple planetary crisis, climate disruption, pollution, and catastrophic biodiversity loss is threatening lives and livelihoods everywhere. But we can turn things around. Humanity has shown time and again that we are capable of great things when we work together across geographies and generations. To do so, we need an inclusive and networked multilateralism, one that ensures young people have a seat and a say in shaping our common future. We need your creativity, courage, and commitment. I draw hope from seeing your generation challenge the status quo and call for transformative challenge. The United Nations is your steadfast ally in striving to build a more just, sustainable, inclusive, and peaceful world for all. Thank you. So from the UN Secretary General to the NMUN Deputy Secretary General, my name is Tobias Dietrich and I'm the Deputy Secretary General for NMUN 2023. Once more, welcome to the National Model United Nations New York 2023 Conference.
It is my honor to stand here in front of you at the beginning of this conference. It is a pleasure to see how many young and enthusiastic students from all over the world have made their way here to New York City in order to learn about the United Nations and to experience what it means to be a diplomat. 10 years ago, I was sitting where you are sitting right now for my first ever NMUN. Would I have thought back then that I'd be standing here to speak to you as the Deputy Secretary General at some point? Not really. Maybe I dreamed about it a little bit. Preparing for this conference, I thought back to 2013 and I found the conference t-shirt of that year. The theme, the theme back then was change your world. Have I changed the world since then? I hope I did at least on a small scale. However, something I'm sure about is that NMUN has changed my world. Joining the volunteer staff and creating a fulfilling experience for many delegates is something I enjoy a lot. And while we, as a volunteer staff, have worked extremely hard to prepare this conference throughout the last year, it is on all of you to make it a successful one. And this brings me back to 2023 and our conference theme for this year's conference, which is Radical Empathy, Peace Reimagined. I guess this theme may not be completely self-explanatory, so let me give it a try and give you some context. I actually want to start with the second part, peace reimagined. Unfortunately, nowadays, not even the traditional meaning of peace as the absence of war seems to be common sense anymore. Therefore, it cannot be stressed enough that the foundation of a peaceful world order is what the UN Charter states in Article 2. All members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force. Having this meaning of peace, which is of utmost importance for all of us in mind, I want to draw your attention to another dimension of peace, which we can feel if we start to reimagine it. Peace in that sense can happen every day and for all of us this week. Peace can start when you really try to understand the perspective of the delegate sitting next to you, it can start by making a compliment about a good speech somebody else gave. Or it can simply start when asking somebody how they're doing today. This is the sense of peace we wanted to express with our conference theme. And I deeply want to encourage every single one of you, no matter if you're here for the first time or have been here many times before, to embrace this idea of a reimagined peace this week. Last year's Deputy Secretary General, Estefany Morales, referred to our NMUN conference as a co-created space. And while we as the volunteer staff are creating the foundation for this conference, it will also be your job as delegates to allow everyone to have a good experience throughout this week. And I'm sure there will be hard negotiations and sometimes disagreements, but please do always remember to treat each other with respect and strive to treat your counterpart the way you want to be treated. If we all do this, we will all be able to feel reimagined peace. So what about radical empathy? Let's start with empathy. Empathy is about feelings. Simply put, it's trying to recognize and understand what people around you feel and trying to put yourself in their position to feel what they are feeling. Empathy is what can you make you feel welcome in a group of strangers. Empathy can help you to convey a message to somebody else by trying to anticipate how it could be received. And empathy can also help to solve conflicts if we're all trying to understand how the situation affects everyone involved. So what does radical mean in the context of radical empathy? The term radical often has a negative connotation as extreme or revolutionary. In this case, it is more about actively using empathy and fundamentally changing how we see others. It's about a change from judging others to accepting them. 
about giving empathy a much higher priority than we normally do. Let's all try to pay more attention to the people around us. Let's make sure to help each other, listen to each other, and work together in order to be successful, both on a personal as well as a substantive level. And while I have the honor to speak to you during this opening ceremony, I would not be standing here without an amazing team that has worked hard for a whole year to prepare this conference. They will be leading you through the conference which is ahead of us and will, be do, will do their best to make sure it will be a success. At this point, I want to introduce you to our senior staff for this year's conference. I'd ask you to please wait with your applause until I've called them all. Under Secretary General for the General Assembly Department, Vincent Carrier. Under Secretary General for the ECOSOC Department, Caitlin Hopper. Under Secretary General for the Development and Human Rights Department, Tiffany Dow. Under Secretary General for the Peace and Security Department, Sitlali Mora Catlet. Under Secretary General for the Conference Management Department, Stephen Rimbakusomo. Assistant Secretary General Nadine Musa, Assistant Secretary General Mike Weitzel. Please give them a big round of applause. <laughs> and while this group is very experienced and well versed in running a conference like this, we still couldn't run the 16 committees we have, along with all the conference management tasks, without our volunteer staff directors and assistant directors. So I'd ask all of them to please rise, and I'd ask you to give them another round of applause. Today's world faces many challenges. With the topics we have chosen for NMUN 2023, we try to cover a variety of these concerns. We hope that you will all use your ideas, energy, and motivation to find the best possible solutions for the issues of our generation. You will be working on topics like climate change, migration, artificial intelligence, gender inequalities, or involvement of youth, to only name a few. Many of these topics relate to the Sustainable Development Goals, the overarching framework of the United Nations. The 17 goals we want to achieve until 2030 become more and more challenging, with progress on several of the goals still being very limited. Nonetheless, the past has shown that without ambitious goals, there won't be any progress. I urge all of you to use your skills to contribute to addressing the problems of today's world. And while you'll be working as diplomats during this week of NMUN, I hope that many of you will take this spirit back home and also use their energy in addressing those challenges in your countries and communities. While it sometimes seems like what you can do on a small scale doesn't really change a whole lot, I can assure you it does. If we all start with doing something, it will amount to a lot in the end. If we all just keep doing nothing, if we all just keep doing what we've always been doing, nothing will change. As UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said, we are on a highway to climate hell with our foot still on the accelerator. We need to do something now, and we all know that for many of the effects caused by climate change, we are already at a point where it is hard to reverse them. And still, the world is extremely slow in doing something about it. Every single one of you can make a difference as delegates during this week and as committed young people back home. Use your skills and your energy to change something. Like I said in the beginning, go out and change your world. And do it by having reimagined peace in mind. Let's all together make this conference a success. Thank you.
And with this, it is my honor to introduce to you our Secretary General for NMUN 2023, Ismail Dogar. Thank you, Toby. <clears throat> Good evening, delegates, faculty advisors, and esteemed guests. My name is Ismail Dogar, and it is my distinct pleasure of personally welcoming you all to the 2023 National Model United Nations Conference in New York. And it is my honor to serve as this year's Secretary General. Over the past year, while the Secretariat has been hard at work in preparing for this year's conference, the world has also continued to undergo seismic changes in many aspects of humanity's collective lives. The remnants of the pandemic era, especially the emotional and economic scars that COVID has left, continue to be felt by many. The war in Ukraine reached its first year anniversary with the stakes between Russia and the West becoming more consequential than ever before. A shifting and uncertain climate that is growing more destructive annually continues to wreak havoc on those that have contributed least to its phenomenon. Further, the continued rise of political extremism in liberal societies, such as the January 6th style storming of the presidential palace in Brazil earlier this year, as well as the attempted destruction of the independent judiciary by the conservative lawmakers in Israel are just a few but growing set of alarming examples that demonstrate that many of the democratic institutions and norms that we take for granted are under full assault in many regions of the globe. Under this backdrop of an uncertain world, when choosing the theme of this year's conference, radical empathy, peace reimagined, we couldn't help but note the significant deficit of humanity within the international community and throughout societies when attempting to solve some of the most existential crises. The dawn of the internet age shrank distances of communication in a way humanity has never experienced before. However, at the same time, with the rise of social media, it has siloed and polarized us to where the quality of information is no longer reliable, or in many instances, even factual. Further, these networks have served like the virtual Greek youth narcissists, whereby only our assessment of the environment around us is reflected as the only perspective of the world. So what exactly is empathy? Empathy is the action of understanding, being aware of and sensitive to the experience and feelings of one another, which essentially means placing yourself in one's shoes to try and understand a different perspective, even if it is not that of your own. Radical empathy, as our esteemed DSG Toby shared earlier, takes this idea further by fundamentally shifting our mindset from one of judgment to one of understanding and acceptance. As I have talked about empathy, Many of you may be wondering, how is this relevant to the week and experience ahead of us? The way I see it, NMUN and experiences like this are a true embodiment of the ideas expressed around empathy. It makes empathy a teachable life skill. You are a delegate having to advocate for ideas and solutions that may not be your own which therefore requires you to put yourself in the shoes of another. And in committee, you will interact with dozens of other, often conflicting ideas, whereby you must seek a common understanding to reach consensus. Simulations like this require empathy and in an environment that allows for curiosity and acceptance of ideas. As I set the tone for this week, I would like to challenge everyone to be the most empathetic versions 
of ourselves. And we can do this if we are following three guiding principles. Number one, assume positive intent. We are over a hundred universities coming from dozens of countries, each with our own unique cultures and identities. As we begin to interact with each other, understand that our perception of interactions may not be the true intentions of each other, and in, in moments of confusion, feel empowered to seek clarification and understanding with each other. Number two, recognize that NMUN is, in the words of our esteemed DSG from the 2022 conference, a co-created space. The problems being presented within the committees are both complex and multifaceted. As such, there will be more than one correct answer to solve the problem, and in fact, will require a plethora of solutions. As you work with each other, recognize that each of you brings answers to solving these problems and that it is very rare for a one-size-fits-all solution. Lastly, practice active listening. Each of you have prepared extensively for this week and are knowledgeable on your assigned countries. As you engage in diplomacy, take the time to listen. With the intention of learning something new, and gathering additional perspectives. Ask questions out of curiosity as opposed to questioning to prove a point, set a trap, or to make another person look foolish. That way, we can create a collaborative, inclusive environment for all. Just as you will hopefully apply these principles to guide you through the coming week, I too will also hold myself accountable in the same way. This is because I believe that we must get back to a point where we transform our communities into empathetic societies if we are to solve the world's most pressing issues. In the words of former US President Barack Obama, Learning to stand in somebody else's shoes, to see through their eyes, that's how peace begins. And it is up to you to make that happen. Empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. With that being said, it is now my pleasure to officially open the National Model United Nations 2023 Conference. But, but wait, don't go yet, there are announcements. The, 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 the first and most obvious announcement is that we need the staff members seated behind us to get to your committee rooms before you do in order to open the rooms. So if you could stay seated for a moment and we could allow all of these people to leave and get to the rooms to get them set up, committee will be able to be started much more easily. Thank you to all of you. That was announcement number one of three. Announcement one of three is complete. Announcement number two of three involves three R's. Three R's. I was going for alliteration. Our, our, our number one is respect. Our keynote speaker probably said it better by saying being kind and compassionate. But if you read some of the emails that went out, we are asking all of you, and since you're all in the room, you're all here to remember to treat each other with respect. We're in suits and ties. Seems pretty obvious, but I think that as excited as we all are for the conference, 
if we can remember some of that energy and some of the cultural differences and talk to each other when we're first feeling slighted, we can resolve some of those issues and have a good conference. And if we can facilitate some of those conversations through your head delegates and through your faculty advisors, we're happy to do so. But if we can keep at the forefront the educational mission of the conference, it will facilitate everyone's experience. R number one. R number two, recruit. So I started off today by saying that 53%, 57, 57% of you are not from the United States. And those 57% of you are like, then why did you have the keynote speaker talk about you could join the US Foreign Service, we're not US citizens. Don't worry, we have you covered. Tomorrow, at 10 a.m., there is a delegate seminar that we are excited about. The United Nations is coming and recruiting here. So if you have not read your program, which is also posted in the video wall on the second, you can also go to nmun.org conference, uh, look at the materials in the program. But the United Nations is sending three people from human resources to talk about careers at the United Nations because they also figured out that they need bright young people who believe in the United Nations and that is what you all are. So if you'd like to hear more about working for the UN, not just simulating it, 10 a.m. in the Trianon Ballroom on the third floor tomorrow. Our one respect, our two recruit, our three reception, in case you didn't see that email and you have a purple, are they purple? Faculty advisor ribbon, they are indeed purple. So faculty advisors, there is a welcome reception for you while the rest of you are busily setting the agenda as one, two, or two, one. Those are the only two choices. Um, there's a reception for faculty advisors that will be in concourse A on the lower level. There is an elevator and a staircase in the main lobby off of 6th Avenue. That was R1, R2, and R3. Um, <laughs> it is now 7.01, so the third of three announcements is the keynote speaker was only expected to speak for five to seven minutes because of her cold, and she was really enthusiastic about being here. So we have one of our video contest award winners from last year, so we'll play it if you wanna stay and watch, but otherwise, well, let's do this. If you are seated underneath the balcony so that you don't trample one another, um, why don't we dismiss by that? But if we still have someone that'll play the video, the rest of you can watch a video for three minutes and then leave after that. Okay, so yeah, balcony and people underneath who had bad views, you can go to committee and we'll play the video and then the rest of you can leave after that. Welcome to the conference, announcement's over. <laughs> For over 13 years, Collin College has participated in the New York National Motto United Nations Conference. After two years of COVID, our team has finally returned to the city in person. NMUN is a simulation of the United Nations for college students, giving young adults the opportunity to research pressing topics related to the real world issues and act as a representative of the country selected. Guess what? Guess, guess what? what? Guess what? 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 <laughs> you tell me. Okay, I start my own working paper with like 17 of signatories. It's about to combine. And like this is my whole group right here. Students have the opportunity to gain real-world experiences, learn how to think diplomatically, build friendships, expand their skill set, and learn how to excel as a leader. Once you get into the mechanics of how the thing works, it's not too bad. There's a lot of socializing, you make some friends, and if I can make it through it, so can you. To prepare for the conference, we were quizzed with drill questions, researched and wrote our position papers, and brainstormed innovative solutions to global issues. We worked on confidently delivering speeches and team building in our weekly Friday meetings.
Modeling meant to me is family. Being true to who you are. Community. Love. Teamwork. Inclusion. Friendship. Confidence. Uh, good people, mainly. Uh, I've made a couple friendships that won't hopefully last a lifetime. And uh, I really just enjoy it. It's just nice being in a place where everybody's so positive and we're all working. Thank you. Almost. <laughs> You're sweet, but that will be passes.